on my screen again. And now I can get into presentation mode. Here we are. So we are recording. This is the AI engineering community. Um, for all of you that uh, have been part of Software Center, I think you're all aware that we have defined something which we have, we have called the holistic DevOps framework, where we say that the software development organizations in the future will have to focus on three types of development, requirements-driven development, um, perhaps a little bit more the software engineering community kind of working, the data-driven or outcome-driven development, where we do A-B testing and, and related things, which uh, you will find in the theme uh, four or Helena's theme, and then AI-driven development, which is one of the, the topics for the AI engineering community and, and the main topic for the coming hour. What I did want to stress is that in my mind, we are at the very early stages of adopting artificial intelligence. I often use the analogy with the introduction of electric motors in factories. Uh, and the interesting thing was when the steam engines that was were used in, uh, in factories were replaced with electric motors, it turned out that they basically just replaced the steam, a central steam engine with one big electric motor. And it took around 25 to 30 years for all the factories in the world to basically redesign themselves around small electric motors in every device that you see here, so every manufacturing spot, instead of the single huge electric motor that would then basically replace the steam engine and drive things forward. So I believe that we're still in the very early years of adopting artificial intelligence. And one of the key things that we see is that many of the companies are struggling uh, with uh, adopting uh, AI, and, and that's why I'm so happy with our keynote speaker today. I did want to stress that this afternoon in the AI engineering uh, 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 theme session, you will see presentations by several of the people here who will talk about some of the research that they've been doing. So we will hear Lucy talk about monitoring and logging. Uh, we will hear Aishwarya talk about data pipelines, Maynard about design methods and processes, Theodore about labeling, semi-automated and, mod and, mod and, and uh, automated labeling, Hong Yi around federated machine learning and deep learning models. And then finally, Evi Chachinkovic will talk about an update on the uh, uh, Chalmers AI Research Center. So what I wanted to do is basically, with that quick introduction, switch the floor to Björn Treje from Praltarion. Björn, it is not easy to find pictures of you on the internet, <laughs> but I did manage to find one. So, uh, so I hope that that's okay. That's but um, uh, some of you may know that I have worked with uh, Luca and Mons, the founders of uh, Peltarion, for some time now. I am totally blown away with uh, the work that um, Peltarion is doing, and, and I'm uh, super impressed with the enormously uh, qualified team with very, very smart and talented people that the company has managed to establish. And uh, among those uh, highly talented people, there is one person that I think really stands out, and that is Björn Trey, the person that has agreed to give us a presentation today. So uh, Björn, I'm really grateful that you are uh, uh, that you agree to give an overview of the technology that is uh, at Peltarion. We have in principle until 12 o'clock, so I, I'm not quite sure how long you want to present. It would be great if we would have some time for questions at the end for uh, that people might have. But I'd love to um, uh, get as much of, uh, we, we would all like to learn as much as possible about what your view on artificial intelligence and specifically deep learning is and what Peltarion uh, has done in that space over the last uh, years. So with that, Björn, I would like to leave the floor to you. Thank you, John. Thank you. No, I'm really, I'm super excited to be here. I mean, it's such a great crowd and opportunity to be able to tell you about all the sort of cool and amazing stuff that has been happening the last years. Now, now let me see if I'm able to share the screen. I work in you know, a various amount of, I'm sharing right now, right? Yes, you are. Yes, you're I not, You're not in presentation mode yet, but that's coming. Yeah, it's coming. All right. 
And I, I work, I mean, it seems I'm working in four or five different video uh, video workshopping tools. Now, I mean, basically what I'm talking about today is, I mean, the, the common theme is, of course, AI engineering. But then again, what is AI engineering? And to me, AI engineering is basically AI sort of, I mean, an engineer wants to solve a problem, right? So AI engineering to me is when we use AI to solve a problem. And that is what I'll be talking about. So we'll start off with a bit of, uh, you know, the current state of NLP and what is NLP? I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll show you some models in action, basically a customer case explaining what we do. Moving on to multilingual NLP, I mean, even harder word, basically, and since NLP is basically text an analyzing text using AI, multilingual NLP is doing that in multiple languages. I'll show you a bit of a sort of demo how you could do it yourself. And then we'll talk a little bit about the frontiers. What's happening at, you know, what are the supercomputers doing? First off, uh, Peltarian, as uh, John told you, I mean, Luke and Mons, uh, the founders, they started, basically started Peltarian, I mean, many years ago. But, you know, in 2004, AI and deep learning, that was such a small niche thing. So the current journey we're on uh, started in 2016 where we introduced external capital to do what we are doing right now, which is basically building and providing a cloud-based platform. And why do we do that? Because we believe that AI should be in the hands of everybody. I mean, just like you have electricity in all the rooms of your house, we want AI to be in the hands of everybody. And the way we do that is we provide a no-code AI platform specifically for deep learning. And I'll show you a glimpse of it later on, but basically what it is, it means that if you have a data set, if you have some images, or if you have some text, you could basically sign up, try it out, and you could train your very first, maybe, deep learning model without writing a single line of code and deploy it with two clicks. To me, it's, I mean, it's fascinating how easy it is, uh, but it's for yourself to decide. And then a bit on who am I? So what do I do? I'm a delivery lead at Peltarian Expert Services. It basically means that I do, of course, uh, I mean, there's some advisory and there's some solution architecture, uh, but overall I, I lead a, a lot of our customer projects. And the difference between leading customer projects in AI and maybe in more traditional software engineering is that when you do a proof of concept in AI, Basically, there is often no specification of what should be done. There is just a problem that should be solved. So there's a lot of uh, commercial advisory as well. Uh, I do this kind of stuff, public speaking, which is often, when it comes to AI, often combined with educating. So I do education workshops, such as the image that John showed was from uh, IoT Hub, uh, Lean Shopping Science Park. We had a three workshop series. Basically, I'm an electrical engineer starting off. Uh, I, I, I actually thought when I, switched, I applied for KTH, I thought, that, hey, I know everything about computers, right? So let's go for electrical engineering. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. So for the last 15 years, I worked in almost any position possible uh, within the software engineering. And for the last three years uh, or so, it's been machine learning. And for the last year, year and a half, it's been deep learning. I wouldn't consider myself a data scientist, even though I can build and train my own models. So the era of NLP. Now NLP, what is NLP? NLP stands for Natural Language Processing, aka analyzing text using AI. Of course, you could incorporate voice in this as well, but let's uh, keep to written text today. So NLP took a revolutionizing turn in 2018, and this is to be compared with sort of the revolutionizing turn that we took in images back in sort of 2010, 2012. And, and the same thing sort of led up to this. I mean, we had better computing power, we had transfer learning, which is basically um, train on one data set and then use that model on another data set. And we have a lot of large and open text data sets. I mean, hey, we have the internet. So in 2018, Google first showed by introducing their model BERT, which we'll be talking a little bit more about, that deep learning for NLP works. And what do we mean by works? It means that suddenly the way an AI model, the way a computer can understand a text 
is on par or even better than a human. I mean, AI and computers have been trying to understand text for a long time. Uh, so the measurement for comparing how good is a computer, how good is a model, it's called GLUE, General Language Understanding Evaluation Benchmark. It's basically a set of tasks or tests that a, you ask a human to do uh, based on the understanding of a text, and then you ask the AI model to do the same. And in 2019, for the first time, the AI model beat the human in this. And the model doing this was BERT. And BERT is a uh, open, available for everyone model uh, cr created and trained by Google. And BERT is basically an acronym that stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation from Transformer. I mean, that's a long word. The interesting part of this, uh, what is, I mean, why is this different from before. If you consider the left part here, word to vec, I mean, before these models, these new NLP models, uh, a word, I mean, the way, the way these models understand and interpret the word and sentences, they basically calculate a mathematical representation of this. Consider a large room, and in this room, you need to put all the sentences and words available somewhere in this room, depending on what they mean. Before BERT, uh, the word bank uh, in the sentence open a bank account compared to the sentence how is the river bank formed would be considered the exact same word. But with BERT and the self-attention mechanism, this means that the model would know what that specific word bank means in the specific sentence and context. So the word bank in open a bank account and how is the river bank formed basically have two different representations, like, uh, like humans have different representations for these two banks. So suddenly it's possible to use AI to analyze text. Now, of course, I mean, it took a lot of training and a lot of words. It took three billion words of training data to do this. It took, I mean, 6,000 TPU hours TPU is basically Google's own processor for this. And I mean, to summarize what this model can do that couldn't be done before, was basically know the difference between the three identical words in the left example and in the right example. And when you have this model, you can do a lot of other stuff. I mean, for instance, the similarity search, I mean, it's, it's a common example. Uh, given the sentence, will artificial intelligence end the world? Uh, you could ask for similar sentences with previous models as well. It would just compare words. Now we can have sentences that are similar without containing any identical words. Consider the second suggestion there, is technology destroying humanity? It doesn't share a single word, but you would still consider it quite similar. So that's fascinating. And how come? Because these two sentences, they are positioned very close to each other in this big room of mathematical representations. It's called embeddings. And we'll get back to this when we talk about multilingual models as well. So BERT, uh, what can you do with BERT? And BERT, first of all, the first BERT version uh, released uh, was only available in English. So when you speak of only of BERT, we're talking about the English language. And the things you can do, I mean, a, top, uh, a selection of topics would be in classification, your typical AI task. Given a set of text, you could put a label, what is this about? It's your typical customer support errand, okay? So the customer wrote this, try using AI to uh, try to analyze what is it about? What product is it about? You can use sentiment analysis, which just basically means it's another type of classifier. Is the customer writing this happy or sad or angry or upset or whatever? You could use it to do question answering. You could feed the BERT model uh, a couple of hundred of your product PDFs and then ask questions about it. Can Google Home answer me in English? Well, it would just read all the documents that you send it about Google Home and try to answer you. You do named entity recognition, which we'll get back to in the example. 
which is basically send a sentence to BERT, and BERT will tell you what are the entities, where is the name, where is the city, where is the metric, where is the product, extract what, what kind of words is this sentence made up from. And uh, as I should just show you previously before, the semantics textual similarity, which is also included in the customer case I'll show you. Given a specific sentence, give me a similar one. And all these specific language tasks, I mean, taken isolated, you might wonder, what am I supposed to do with those? But when you combine that, you get really powerful applications, which I'll show you. All right, so talk a, a little bit about Ipsos. Uh, we're working with Ipsos. Ipsos is one of the, sort of the, the largest, uh, uh, largest, largest actors in doing customer research and surveys. Uh, if you would be a large, uh, large stock company and you would need to know, all right, so what does my customers think of this new car? Or what does my customers think of this product that we're about to launch? What do they think about my coffee? You would go to Ipsos. And Ipsos work with the largest tier of global companies. Uh, they don't work with smaller companies. And why is that? Because surveys, to do a good survey, you need some expertise. You can't just write a bunch of questions and send them out. That won't be any, any good to analyze. So you need your you need survey expertise, you need your uh, you need your sort of database of questions and all that together, you create your survey and you send it out. Uh, so you need the consultancy, which means that the projects, the size, the budgets might be too big for the smaller companies. But as you can see in the tier below, the blue part of the pyramid, I mean, there's three million companies around the world interested in doing this, but right now aren't doing business with Ipsos. And of course, there's a tier below that, but they're so small that they're most likely use Google Forms and do this themselves. So. Ipsos wanted to reach out to this new customer segment, expanding their business. And the way they wanted to do this, they said, okay, so we, we have to do this DIY style. We have to enable these companies to set up their own surveys. But the problem is to build a questionnaire in a professional way, you require expertise. So how can we decode this expertise into something that they can use DIY style. Well, basically what we're working on with Ipsos is a, uh, we call it a smart questionnaire engine. And all these parts are based on BERT models and similar. So we have three parts to this. Uh, I'll show you one of them, which is the similarity. Uh, and the similarity is live, that's why I can show it to you. That would give you, based on a suggested question, it would give you suggestions of other similar questions that might not share a single word, but have similar meaning. Correlation is a uh, set of other models that would give you, based on a single survey question, will give you uh, other questions, sort of the, the uh, typical e-commerce recommendation. Other surveys to use this question also had these questions. And of course, there's its translation. And translation, we can work with translation without having to use Google Translate or Simras. We'll just use the gigantic database of historical surveys from Ipsos. And we will place all these questions in these, you remember the room of a mathematical representations. And if two questions from two different languages are in the same place, they might actually mean the same thing. So we can go, we can use that same representation space to use to go with translation. So the first one then similarity. We develop something called question library for this. And what question library is, and you'll show this. I'll, uh, I recorded the movie actually when I try this out. Is basically based on a single set of questions. I input my brand, my product category, and a timestamp. It will give me suggestions of question. So let's look at a three minute movie of how this looks. You're supposed to hear the voice as well now. Uh, we can't hear the voice, uh, Björn. Oh, okay. So if you stop, if you, uh, are you on a PC or on a Mac? A Mac. 
Yeah, so that we have a problem because uh, Mac doesn't allow sharing system sound when you share. I All ran right. into that this morning. Okay. But maybe you just let it run without a voiceover and maybe you can do the talking yeah. because we can't okay. hear the video anyway. All right, that's perfect. I'll, I'll do my own voiceover then. Uh, okay, so first off, what I did was I logged into Ipsos Digital. Uh, you can try this out your own. It means free to try out. I created a survey. Uh, I basically set it up to be in the United States because right now we only feature English. I selected my target, general population. I said I would like 100 respondents to do a length of survey of five minutes. I would like it back in 16 hours and I get a prize. All we need to, need, need to do now is fill it out with some questions. Right, and you see the currency in the switch crown, so you can change it. Now, let's move on to actually starting to create questions. Uh, I'll just wait for the. So, <clears throat> so what you input here is uh, this is the place where I input my question. All right, so uh, basically, what would my question be? What do I want to know here? Uh, probably something uh, around my coffee. I'm a coffee brand. So when did you last drink coffee? That is the one I want to know. I opened the question library. I put in my brand, Paltarion. I put in my product category, coffee, and a timestamp, month. And I would instantly get a suggestion of similar questions. Uh, when did you last use or buy each brand of coffee? When was the month you drank coffee? And this is the name, the entity recognition, and the similarity search in conjunction with each other. Uh, and all these questions, they come from the large database that Ipsos have of, of questions that the experts have written in the past. Um, and since I also inputted my product category, we can also help out with the uh, responses based on the what we have in uh, in store from certain and if i were to select a, another question you would see that instantly we get a new set of suggestions uh, all right so let's move on to that was the quick demo let's move on to what actually happens here so the front end to the right uh, which was what you saw. In there, the user actually enters a question. What do I want to know about my specific brand of coffee? That question is being sent to the backend. The backend is basically orchestrating a couple of AI models and also some smart heuristics. Uh, I will return to them. So this question, what brand of, when did you last drink coffee? That will be decoded using the uh, named entity recognition model, which will extract and um, the information about this sentence saying, okay, where is the product, where is the brand, and where is the timestamp? Save that information, and then go move on to the next model, which is basically the uh, another BERT model, which will calculate these embeddings, find where in this large mathematical room that this question is positioned. And then look in the gigantic database of a million questions that Ipsos have and say, OK, so what other historical quest survey questions do we have that are close to this question? Send them back to the uh, send them to the backend. The backend will then use the same named entity recognition tagger. And extract from the suggested questions. What's the product? Where's the product? Where's the category? Where's the timestamp? Take the suggested questions together with the entity information, send it to the front end, and the front end will basically replace the category, product, and timestamp with what I want it to have. So what I get is a set of already formatted questions that I can use. Uh, because it might be the first time that I actually create or set up a survey. So I'm not sure how to actually ask 
these questions. But then the suggestions I get are, are all of these suggestions are questions that are originally created by the Ipsos survey experts. Uh, so that is one sort of similar example. And we just put this in uh, production. And hopefully if I were to talk to you again in uh, six months or so, I could show you about the correlation and the translation. So this is a super exciting thing where we use uh, two, three, a bunch of different models together to form a product. Now you might wonder, am I sort of, am I explaining all the secret sauce of Ipsos here to you? But no. Anybody heard me talking before would, would know that I would say, so this, the technology is basically a commodity. Anybody can use these models. Anybody who worked with NLP would know, would just look at this and say, well, I'd say it's a near tiger and similarity search. I mean, there's nothing to it. What we need here, what no one else has, is the one million questions in Ipsos database and getting back to the smart heuristics I was talking about. In order to develop a smart AI solution, the AI is just one part. When you put the AI into the, into the uh, front end, there are a lot of things that you realize that, okay, so AI is just one part. As an example, the question I inputted to the model, I mean, I would get a, the results I get back would be similar questions. But if I were to get always get the most similar questions, that might not add any value to the end user. Because the similar, those most similar questions, they might be so similar that they are more or less the same question. So you want similar questions, but not entirely similar questions. So we used, we worked with the uh, Ipsos uh, survey experts to include a lot of smart heuristics. Okay, based on the result that you get from the AI model, how do you want to work with that to present it to the front end? How do we decode the survey expertise skills into this? Um, and that is something I should remain, let remain hidden here. Okay, so we spoke about NLP, we spoke about BERT, and it's all in English. But what about all the other languages of the world? I mean, all these recent developments, how is that important if your company only has Swedish data, Norwegian or Arabic for that case? How do we deal with many languages? I mean, of course, a lot of resources have been put into developing language specific models. There's the German BERT model, there's the Swedish BERT model, and there's a Dutch BERT model. But if you're a global company or if your company with a global audience, it's really time consuming to set up a hundred different language models to interact with your customers. Are there other options? I mean, what if we could have one single multilingual model? So introducing multilingual models, and there are specifically two of them that we worked with. They are the most sort of common, which is multilingual BERT, Google's, the same technology as before, just with lots of languages. And then Facebook, who of course also has a pretty good data set on this, they have built their own XLMR R. And these multilingual models, what are they? Well, remember the room of mathematical representations? where a sentence is placed, or a word is placed based on what it means. These multilingual models, what they've done is they've just taken a hundred languages, training data, did the mathematical representation and put them in the same room. So if I were to go in this mathematical room, make it my, make it my living room, and behind that couch, there's the English word cat, there's also the Swedish word cat. And they are just neighbors. And the English word kitten, which is a similar, I mean, it's not the same, it's similar. It's also there behind the couch, just a little bit of far from cat. So what they've done is, I mean, if you talk about uh, multilingual birch, which is the one I'll show you a bit more of, we have a hundred languages, all decoded into embeddings in the same space. So these multilingual models, Basically, they, they don't care about what language you're using. They just take your text, 
which I defined where in this room would it be? And that means that you can actually use this model, train it on data from one language, and then use it on another. I'll show you an example. So to visualize the power of um, multilingual models, we were looking for, specifically we were looking for a Swedish data set because we're a Swedish company. So we realized, okay, Swedish parliament, that's open data, right? So we downloaded 32,000 motions uh, from 2010 and onward. And then we tried to teach AI politics. So what we did, we took all these motions. We, of course, we had to replace the name uh, Center Partiet, Miller Partiet, we just Partiet. And we split all these motions into shorter paragraphs, chunks of one to four sentences. And we trained the model based on these text and sentences. And then with the combine it with, okay, with the labels, who, what party actually wrote this? And then we tried to see, did this model learn politics? To the right, you see a, just a clustering visualization, which is basically a uh, very this sort of compressed way to visualize all these thousands of dimensions. As you can see, uh, and, or each little data point, a dot here, is one of these paragraphs, chunks of sentences. And as you could see, it seems that data from the same party are clustered together. So what the model does is basically just takes the input, these four sentences, and learns, it learns basically what it's talking about, the style it's written in, and a couple of more things. And then it compares all of these things together. And as you can see, it did actually learn politics, especially for the um, for most of the companies. I mean, I, the hardest one well, I think was the Centre Party, the Liberal, the middle parties, of, of course. And if you would ask this model anything, I to make a visualization, just set up a front end, and I took the text as you can see. The left here, that is basically straight off Milia Partiet's homepage. I input it to the model and I ask the model, what party is this? And then I Google translated the same text into English. And I asked the model, what party is this? And then I Google translated it to Arabic. And I asked the model, what party is this? And as you can see by the bar chart, we get very similar results. And the fascinating thing about this, this model had never seen any motion at all in English or Arabic. It only had a general understanding of Swedish, English and Arabic, but it had only seen, only been trained and fine tuned on the Swedish motions. And it still, it works for a hundred different languages. To me, that's mind blowing. I mean, consider the possibilities for global companies or consumer products in using this. Now, of course, since we have a uh, AI platform and we believe in empowerment, we believe in putting AI in the hands of everybody, we wanted to put multilingual AI into the hands of everybody. So we put the MBERT, the multilingual BERT pre-trained model on our platform available for everyone to use. So uh, I'll just show you how you could do it. Just it'll be a couple of minutes from zero to AI hero. All right, Peltarian.com. Log in. Of course, I have an account. If you don't, you can just sign up for the free trial. Uh, this is my star page. I'll just make it a little bigger. This would be my the projects I'm working on. This is my all the things, the experiments I'm running. Now, what do I need to do? I need to start a new project. Let's call it uh, book genre demo. So what we'll do is we'll train a model uh, based on book examples. So we have a couple of book examples, a couple of Swedish, a couple of uh, German, a couple of Russian, 
we have some Mandarin, etc. And all of these uh, book text have a tag that says what genre is this. And so we'll combine data from different languages into the same data set to create a bigger data set. OK, so we, I've got a new project. The way I upload things, the way I input data into my model would be OK, so I could just uh, point to a URL. I could upload something from my computer. I could go with Google BigQuery or Microsoft Azure Synapse. I could push it through a data API. Or the simplest thing, which I will do right now, I'll just use a data library. We have a set of data here, uh, which makes it quite easy to use to get going to learn deep learning. So let's go with the multilingual book corpus data. 18,000 data points. Import it. And while we wait here, uh, you can see that we are using four tabs, dataset, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. So uh, this data, this is what the data looks like. We have an author, we have a language, we have a genre, we have a title, and a sentence. The only thing we'll be interested, interested in today is the sentence and the book genre. Let's not do anything else with this data. Let's just save it and use it in a new experiment. There you go. Oh. My connection doesn't like me. Right, why we wait for that? <laughs> Let's go with the one I already created. So uh, the good thing, which I'll hopefully be able to show you in a bit, is that uh, once we created a model, this will be the modeling view, uh, going from sentence to genre. And I, basically, I don't have to do anything at all to, uh, I don't have to know anything about AI to, to create this. Uh, the wizard, which I wanted to show you here, which is now being reloaded, uh, basically suggests to me that, okay, so uh, I, I see that you have text data, uh, then I suggest that you use uh, a multilingual model and you go with the default and then just save it. And this is what I would get. I'm pretty happy with all the default settings. I will go with five epochs, uh, which is basically uh, uh, five iterations. Uh, I would use early stopping, uh, which means that when the model doesn't improve anymore, uh, it can just stop. This is the data set I would like to use. Uh, and I would just click run here. But in order to make sure that you don't have to wait 20 minutes for me to run this model, uh, let's just go to evaluation. So uh, while the experiment is uh, running, you could follow it here. And I mean, there's a lot of ac there's a lot of metrics, of course. Uh, so I won't go into details of this, uh, but you can just see continuously improving here. And once I'm satisfied, I'll just move on to the deployment. New deployment, create it. And here it is. If I were to be a web developer, I would just use this information. Uh, and if I uh, would like to try this out, I could just Deploy it and enable it. And oh, of course, let's go back to this one. So, what this model would do is basically uh, this is the same model created behind the scenes, and uh, we provided a front end for this.
it will basically classify uh, your text to a different book genre. And uh, these examples, none of these examples were actually shown to the model. None of these examples were used in the training data. And as you can see, they are written in different languages. Uh, and it will say that, OK, this is history. So let's go with this one. Uh, the Frida Kahlo. Well, as you can see, there's a bit of a cold start there. Yep, that's biography. And the interesting part, of course, you could just start entering thing here. Once there was a little girl, etc. Uh, and this, of course, would be a children's story. But if you would continue this, uh, I think this will work. Uh, she is a secret agent. Uh, oh, of course, I don't remember the exact wordings then. I mean, depending on what you write there, it would, of course, continue to classify. Uh, but move on to why this is such a good thing. So what I wanted to show you there with the demo that was reloading uh, is basically that you could, in just in about five minutes, you could go from a data set to a uh, complete and trained model. Let's get back to this presentation. And just to be clear, Bjorn, I think that this is awesome. Just for the record. Yeah, yeah, perfect. No, I wanted to. I want basically wanted to show you the experimentation uh, wizard. I assume. I mean, there's uh, probably. I mean, the the audience here is probably quite spread in terms of uh, what you know about AI uh, before. Yeah. So that's why I took the time to put this together just to give you a short glimpse of what is actually possible and yeah. some of the scenarios we're discussing uh, with potential clients. I mean. You would, of course, have the typical uh, customer support case. Uh, I mean, you could train based on just training data from Sweden or England or whatever. You could train your entire and automate your entire customer support queuing. And then once it's done, you could roll it out into the entire world without having to do retraining. Exactly. Uh, all right. So uh, the summary of what you could do today with NLP. I mean, we have Bert and its descendants. They are a family of pre-trained NLP models. They are available for everyone to use. And this is one of the uh, exceptional parts of this. Uh, of course, they need to be fine-tuned on your specific data and a specific task, because these language models, they have a common understanding of the language, but they are not trained to do a specific task. So this is where you and your own data come into play. I mean, example, I often get a question, how much data do you need? And we have this uh, you know, rule of thumb that says, OK, start with a thousand examples per category. So you could train uh, one of these models to classify a support ticket. And if your support ticket would have four different outcomes, it might be a bug, it might be a improvement, it might be 12 things. That would be, that would be four classes or categories in this label. That would mean start off with 4,000 examples. Uh, and then reviewing that, you would know. Now, these models can be multilingual. If you select such a version, uh, you can train it in one language and use it for the rest. You can even mix training data. That is also fascinating. Now, what's on the frontiers? Uh, I mean, of course, apart from continuous development of these domain language specific models, uh, and it's important to point out that the language specific models, the Swedish BERT, will most often beat the multilingual version of BERT. Uh, there's also, I mean, for Swedish examples, there are uh, examples of training BERT models on sort of ancient Swedish. So you could automatically translate ancient Swedish to modern Swedish. Now, apart from all that, everybody's talking about GPT. Three. So what is GPT-3? 
Well, it's the largest neural network AI model ever created. And GPT-3, basic stuff, GPT-3 generative, it means it won't output a number, it will output text. Pre-trained means this one is pre-trained and you don't have to put in the millions of words or billions of words and hours. It also a transformer model, that's the architecture and it's version three. What is GPT-3 then? Well, it's a language model released in May 2020 by OpenAI. And we talked about Facebook and Google before and OpenAI, open Elon Musk is one of the funders and founders. It's a hundred times larger than its predecessor, GPT-2, released about two years ago. And it's even 10 times larger than its closest competitor, which was a, a model Microsoft released in January. Now, the cool thing about this, this model can respond to any written language input. You could ask this model anything. You could ask it, you could ask it, what's the number, what's the number of pi? You could ask it, who is Aristoteles? You could give it a task. You can say, please write, please write me a uh, letter in the style of Isaac Asimov. I'll show you an example of this. So this is it's this super cool model that can basically it can seem to do anything and it can respond in tasks. And it can respond in different styles depending on uh, how you ask it. The only drawback of this, apart from being huge and expensive, of course, it's not publicly available. It was released earlier this year with the disclaimer that uh, we're afraid this model is so powerful that we are afraid to release it to everybody. But you can sign up to be a beta tester and use our API until we know more how this model should be used. So it's basically a model that ate the entire internet. There's a data set called Common Crawl, which is basically the entire internet or com publicly known and available internet converted into data set. And they inputted that and they added a lot of other stuff, Wikipedia, etc. And in order to eat this entire training data, this model had to be made up of 175 billion parameters. That means for every bit of input data that you enter this model, you have to multiply it by 175 billion times. So it's quite compute intense. And what it does, as I told you, well, you enter a piece of text and you get a piece of text back. And this thing can even produce code because code is a part of the public known internet and it's a language. So you can, there are examples and applications of asking GPT-3 to write them a application. I'll just show you a simple one. Here. So there's another application developed uh, based on GPT-3 where you can have a mail correspondence with the sort of historical or sort of public figures. So this is a mail written to Isaac Asimov, the uh, American author and most famous known maybe for uh, the three laws of robotics. So dear Isaac Asimov, who is the true inventor of calculus? Regards, Andrew. And then the respond be dear Andrew, and then a long reasoning combining known facts about this in the style of Isaac Asimov. And my favorite would be almost the, uh, the last part. That answers your question. It's a shame, isn't it? That's what's fundamental in mathematics isn't always as simple as that. So this is a cool example. But the same model without any other instructions except from another mail, this time to Hulk. Dear Hulk, why Hulk smash, best banner. And the response would be, of course, giving the facts known about Hulk in the style of Hulk. Dear Bruce, Hulk likes to smash. Why? Hulk not know why. Please help. When the same model giving these two very different responses. And there's also a quite cool thing you could Google. There's an article in The Guardian the Guardian was given access to GPT-3 and they asked GPT-3 to write an essay about how and why artificial intelligence isn't harmful to the human race. 
and it spat out, I mean, it spat out, I think it spat out like 30 different examples, where of eight were really good. And the Guardian then combined these eight articles into one. So just Google the Guardian and GPT-3, and it's a fascinating read. Now, I was supposed to show you a video here, um, but I'll uh, leave this to you to, uh, let me see if I can send you this link in a, in a way. What this is, is basically, it's an interview with GPT-3. Um, and how could you interview a model? Well, as you can see, I mean, based on the mail correspondence, of course, that is possible to interact with this model. So what they did is they wrote the interview, they got the response back, and then they sent those responses to another AI model that generated a video response of it. And the interviewer says, okay, hi, GPT-3. So could a cat pilot a rocket? Uh, and the answer would be yes, if it evolved enough. Okay, smart model. The following, the, uh, the follow-up question, all right, but if this is a standard house cat, uh, could it pilot the rocket then? And the answer would be no. Okay, why not? Because nobody would let it in. Okay, third question. If a cat that would have been let into the cockpit, could that pilot a rocket if it evolved enough? And the answer was, yes, it could, but it would be distracted by the purr of the engines. So it, it can only it can combine facts, but if you ask it a nonsense question, it will give you a joke back. That is fascinating. Uh, but of course, power is expensive. I mean, training the model is equivalent to 355 GPU years. And the GPU is the kind of processor used for deep learning, of course. Uh, and the Bookshong classifier, I wanted to show you, that takes just 15 GPU minutes to train. So this is a super large model and it costed 50 million uh, Swedish crowns solo to pre-train. So this is not something that is available for everyone. Uh, but it's so powerful that the, uh, I mean, you would ask the question, is GPT-3 the solution to every problem? And why doesn't everybody use this? And it's like combining a supercar and a gigantic hauling truck. I mean, it's, it can do amazing things, but it requires skills, a lot of power, and the right infrastructure to use. And this is only trained on what is commonly known. And most likely your domain specific tasks that you work with, they are not commonly known on the internet. And there are examples uh, using GPT-3 to answer and make judgment calls on insurance errands. Um, but the output is, I mean, it's more or less ridiculous and sometimes, and sometimes it makes sense. Uh, the summary of that is that it's super good being a you know, general model it's not very good to answer your domain specific tasks. And it's still quite some bad at some language tasks like comparing to sentences, etc. Uh, and of course, the worst part, it's not available. It's not available and it will not be for some time. So comparing this one to BERT, I mean BERT, the model you can use. So GPT-3 would be your kick-ass friend who helps you out in anything, uh, but isn't the expert what you do at your processes. Well, BERT, and the other models, they, they would be more treated like your colleague who really trains to be the best at solving the task you work with. And BERT is available for you to use. Uh, that is why we put BERT on the platform. We we'll probably put GPT-3 on the platform as soon as it's possible, but we're not there yet. So summarizing this, um, talk a little bit about Palterion, our mission. Uh, we wanna put AI in the hands of everybody. That's why we built the platform. Uh, recommend tutorials for everybody to use. Uh, talked about the current state of NLP, the journey up to the birth models, what they can do. I showed you a bit of models in action, you know, the similarity search combined with a near tagger uh, to build this uh, questionnaire engine. Spoken multilingual NLP, you know, uh, I wanted to show you how you could do this yourself on the platform. Uh, if anybody interested, just mail me. And we talked about the frontiers of NLP. 
and that'll be my final slide. Uh, uh, seeing that there's five minutes for questions now. Mm. That was awesome, Bjorn. Thank you so much for uh, presenting this. So we are a number of people in the call and there are several questions. One of the questions comes from uh, Sherstin from uh, Siemens. I think it's Siem I think it's Siemens, not Health and Ears, but Siemens. And she asks, do we also have the chance to use this tool for projects? Is there a test license available or a free account from the software center? But uh, I mean, my understanding is that there is a, you can sign up for a free account at Peltanion, right? As yeah. a, we have a freemium model. There, there's a freemium model. And right now, I mean, the, the model above the freemium model is I mean, from an enterprise perspective, it's really cheap. Yeah. Uh, and there's no cap in functionality, it's just capped in parallel projects and training power. Yeah, exactly. So, and there are quite a few tutorials on the website as well that help you get going with, uh, with the deep learning uh, projects as well, is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, there's tutorials. I, I would promise you that you would be up and running within the hour of build, to build your own first deep learning model. Yeah, that's awesome. Let me check if someone, Kuhn van Wijk raised his hand. So Kuhn, do you want to... No, sorry, that was a mistake. Okay. Did you have a question or... No, probably not. No, not yet. I just joined again. I was okay. in another session. I just want to <laughs> catch the tail here. Yeah, well, I hope you got something. Are there any other questions uh, to uh, Björn here? Ronald wrote said this was very interesting. That was good. We're happy to hear that. If anyone has a question, either speak up, raise your hand, or type it in the chat. Uh, and I, I could add that if I know it'd be interesting, uh, I, I couldn't do the uh, the entire demo I wanted uh, because yeah. of some upgrades. Because I really wanted to show you how easy it is to uh, train and deploy models. I mean, there, of course, there are many frameworks for this, but just because of what I've seen and what I've known when I talk to people is that there's no better shortcut to, to uh, getting to know and educate yourself with an AI than build your own model. Okay. Use the data, put it in, uh, in action. Absolutely, great. Now, with that, I think we are basically out of time. Oh, there is, oh, no, that was, uh, uh, not a question, but rather a positive comment. Björn, I once again would like to really, really thank you for taking the time to talk us through what is happening in the in the deep learning space. What is Potanion doing? What is BERT? What is multilingual uh, BERT? What is uh, GPT-3, which is, of course, is something that everyone is really curious about, who keeps even an eye on this space. That's awesome, and I really appreciate you taking the time for, uh, for doing this. So thank you, Björn, once again. For all the participants, we're now breaking for lunch. Unfortunately, normally we have in-person events and we go to lunch together, but now everyone has to go and prepare their own lunch. We will reconvene at one o'clock for the theme session. So look at the Software Center website for the links to the theme sessions that you want to be part of, and I look forward to seeing you there. And with that, uh, Björn, once again, thank you very much. Uh, everyone else in the call, thank you for joining. And uh, I will stop recording, which I should have done a while back already. And 